The answer is I'm looking for a guy who is extremely financially abundant, I should say, because that is a byproduct of him probably being a really ambitious guy. Yes. And I have to be with the most hungry, ambitious guy. I mean, he cannot be married to me and not be like hella ambitious. Welcome everybody. This is For the Love of Money, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success by sharing the tools, tips, and stories of those who have already made it. My name is Chris Harder, and each week I will bring you incredible guests in order to prove that when good people make good money, they do great things. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another incredible episode of For the Love of Money. I'm really excited for today's episode because I'm doing something different than I have ever done before. I'm sitting here with my dear friend, Angie Lee, and we are literally going to have a face-off interview. We are facing each other here in person. We're going to interview each other on all things business, money, and even our personal lives. I think you're going to love the answers. They're both entertaining and have massive value inside of them. And besides that, I've got some really exciting news to share with you. I have released a never done before brand new in-depth video training series on three things that are very, very important to your personal worth and your net worth. There are three videos that will train you on the following things. Number one, some brand new research on whether or not money will make you happier. You have to see this one. Number two, how to command your true actual worth. Trust me, your worth is going to change from before you watch that to after you watch that training. And training number three, lastly, a lesson on how the economy works, proving once and for all that there is enough to go around as much as you could possibly want you are entitled to. These three trainings will change everything for you financially. You will literally be, feel, seem like a different person at the end of these three in-depth trainings. And they're totally free. That's the best part. They are totally free. All you have to do is go to fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash free. That's it. Go to fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash free and get your three free video trainings that I just released there for the love of money.com forward slash free. And by the way, if you love them, share them. Number one, they're free. Number two, they are of such massive value. Everybody needs to see these things. Okay. Now for the face off with Angie Lee, here we go. I'm really excited to do this because I've actually never done this before and it turned out so awesome. We're going to interview each other. You guys all know Angie Lee from the famous Angie Lee show. She's a well-known marketing genius and founder of the hit new CBD line, Soul CBD. I mean, everything she touches turns to gold. We have so much we can learn from her. And so it's really exciting to sit down and just rift these questions off of each other. And they go some really surprising directions, by the way. So we discuss some things such as challenges that we're both working through right now, uh, things that we've that held us back in the past and how we got through them. Uh, we talk about what we think makes people successful or not, and, and how to embody those traits. We actually end up taking a weird left turn and answering the age-old question of, do women intentionally seek out men with more money? And what's so interesting is the two different perspectives. You know, I've been married for a long, long time now, and Angie Lee is currently single and seeking. And so the two different perspectives on, do women intentionally seek out men with money? I think you're really going to love that part, and there's a lot to learn there as well. Listen, this episode has tons of value, tons of laughs, so get ready, listen up, because here we go. I am sitting here with the one and only Angie Lee, and we're going to do something different. We're experimenting. We are just going to freaking rift for an hour back and forth, mm -hmm. add value. It's like you guys get to watch outside looking in, peer in on the normal conversations that we we typically have. And uh, we're going to kick it out as content to you guys because I feel like one of the best ways to learn is to sit in the room with the people that are doing yeah. what you want to do. Yeah. And this is their virtual way of doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I feel like something that would be really juicy to start with is having you almost, you know, obviously you've been doing this a little bit longer than me. And so I'm 29 yeah. and I think you have such a great mindset I'm on 41. It. You are. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, but a lot's happened since you were 29 and obviously we were maybe at different places, but if you could go back in time or you could be me and you were in the situation I'm in with my brand and I have a lot of different things going on. And I just think you have such a great mindset around investing, hiring, scaling, all of these things 
that are your strengths, what advice would you give me or what would you do? Oh, this is so good for both of our, our audiences. Yeah. Here's why. It's funny you picked 29. 29 is when we lost everything. So wow. at 29 years old, the recession had just hit. I was in banking. Mm-hmm. We were living way beyond our means. My values were, uh, what does my business card say? How many people am I managing? And what kind of house and car do I have? Yeah. Right. Those were, those were my values. Yeah. And it was this totally false built on a, a glass foundation type of existence. And when the recession hit, uh, I spent a year going around closing bank branches and then I uh, lost all my bonuses and we we're barely getting by borrowing money from our parents uh, to, to barely get by. Wow. And then they came to me and they're like, it's your turn. Here's your severance package. And we use that severance package to pay off all the ridiculous debts to wow. short sell our, our main house that we had just built to get rid of the multiple cars that we had. Why we had a bunch of cars, I don't know. Um, you know, cause it's just Lori and I yeah. to walk away from all of our rental. Like it was a um, financial mess. It was a shit show. Now here's what's cool. Why you asked me about 29. This one and how I would invest differently. This was where two really big things happened. This is where I decided screw working in corporate America. I'm going to go be an entrepreneur like I wanted to in the first place. Yeah. And this was also where, because I was stripped of that BS identity that just came crashing down, I got to choose how I was going to show up in the world and what I really wanted to do with my money when I made it again. And that was a crazy thing. I knew deep down that I'll make it again. Yeah. But I wanted to make sure that when I made it again, this time I did it right. And so looking back to my 29-year-old self or to you sitting here today, Mm -hmm. my advice would be things like this. Don't attach your identity to what you have on the outside. Attach your identity to the impact you're making in other people's lives because that will naturally make the money come in, right? Mm -hmm. But most people have that flipped, especially when you're young and and you're in your 20s. You don't, but I did. The next piece of advice would be play the long game with your money. So don't go squandering it. And you know me, I'm all for nice things and and abundance and all that fun stuff, but don't go squandering it on really unnecessary things. Um, Lori and I adopted this really cool rule back when we were reinventing ourselves financially. We said, if it's a big purchase, let's wait one year on it. If we still want it, then we can go get it. And having that little time out made, made us not buy so many things that we would have thought we wanted in the moment. And then reinvest that money into yourself first and foremost, yeah. then into your business. And if you don't have a business, reinvest it into something that has lo- a long-term compounding effect. Mm. And of course, paying off any debts that you have at the moment. And make sure that you're really setting yourself up with a solid foundation uh, as a human and then also financially. Yeah, Because that's, you know, I'm 41 now and I lost everything early enough to get a, a lesson before it hurt. But if this were to, ha- if I had these habits now, if I showed up this way now, if this is how I live my life now and, and Lori and I want to have a family this year and all this other stuff, that would be the worst timing on the planet. So if I can save anybody from showing up that way and making those decisions, yeah. it's so worth it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's that's the the pickle, right? Of wanting nice things and living a certain lifestyle then also wanting to reinvest it. Okay, how do you balance that? And and I'm going to kind of talk through how I balance it too, but we're just joking downstairs uh, about your jumpsuit and how much it costs. You're like, here, take my card, like take it, right? (laughs) And you've earned that. You are significantly accomplished financially at this Mm -hmm. point. Yet here we are giving advice on one side saying, you know, don't squander your money on dumb things. But you and I also love to buy really nice things that yeah. are way within what we can afford. Yeah. But nonetheless, we're paying big money for really nice things. Yeah. How do you pick and choose what you, you're going to drop your money on? I have a priorities list. And so for me, I have the business and then health and wellness. I feel those are the two biggest things I'm pointing into right now. And I'm constantly asking myself, is this something that is going to bring me joy, make me a better leader or make me happier or healthier or more energized? Right now it's the season of what's going to bring me more energy, what's going to make me healthier. And you know, if you don't feel good, you can't run your business. And so I'll pump in any money I have to into biohacking, health and wellness, all this crazy stuff that I do that is not, not, it's not cheap at all. And then as far as like the home in San Diego and all these really nice things I have now, I have to ask myself, does this make me want to wake up and make more money? Does it inspire me 
to want to be a better leader and to be a better person. And I don't think it's all about those tangible things, but if my home is where I work all day, it's also my office. It's where my team comes over. It's where my loved ones are. If, if my environment doesn't inspire me to be more and to make more, then that's not, that's not where I need to be either. That's and so, so important, by I the way. I see the expense as something that is necessary at that point. And once you've hit a certain level, you never really go backwards. And so if this is my new standard that I set for my life and it's my new identity, then I'm most likely not going to go back to anything else. So here's a silly example. Do you fly first class when you fly? Not always. No. No, because that to me isn't as important as spending a few hundred dollars a week on cryotherapy. Fascinating. Right? So, so I'll choose the priority. Yeah. So <laughs> you will not find me not in a really comfortable first class seat. Yeah. I, I like it is the death of me for some reason because to be <laughs> trapped in a a small seat, you know, next to somebody who's not necessarily of my choosing, mm-hmm. that's one of the things that I pl- uh, I apply high importance to. So it's so mm-hmm. funny how things that you find a lot of value in, mm-hmm. I might be like, ah, eh, sometimes I spend on that, and then things that I find a lot of value in, you're like, ah, eh, take it or leave it. Depends mm-hmm. on the price. Mm-hmm. Aren't we funny human beings? Yeah, it's a priorities thing. It's definitely a priorities because that wouldn't be something that I would need, but it's, it's nice and it's a luxury, but I, I, you pick and choose. I think you have to pick and choose. So I think if we're teaching anything here, it's know what moves the needle for you, mm. but then don't be frivolous on anything that does not move the needle. So for you, yeah. it's uh, the wellness. Mm-hmm. And for you, it's the beautiful home yeah. and, and the great clothes. Those move the needle for you. They make you a better, happier version of yourself that therefore goes out and attracts more business and more yeah. abundance and serves people better. Yeah. For me, it's first class seats and it's getting into a car that I love every time that I get into mm-hmm. it and really great shoes, right? Mm-hmm. So if those things make me a, a better, happier version of myself yeah. and that then goes out and allows me to serve better because I'm happier and I have more energy mm-hmm. and that brings in more abundance, great, that moves the needle. But don't piss away your money on things that other people have if they don't move the needle for you. Yeah. And I think there's something to be said about we're in this dimension, we're in this game and we're, we're here to enjoy tangible physical things. And that's what makes this experience called life fun and enjoyable. That's kind of a a meta conversation right now, but we're allowed to love beautiful things. And I love the feeling of stepping into a beautiful car. I mean, who doesn't? So Who's to say that there's anything wrong with that to a certain level? Yeah, and no, well, there's where, not. I mean, you're sh- always talk about how you're shameless about this. So I think if we're playing this game, why not give yourself something to look forward to each day? Because this gets this can get old and this can get difficult. And so if you're not giving yourself small things to to inspire you to keep going, then yeah, it's don't you let can the, have both. They're not usually exclusive. You can want to help people and have. Oh, a great that's thing, so, so true. And don't let the pendulum sway too far one way or the other. So mm. I always see these two types of of people. Uh, type A they will save every last penny and they will live in a home that they hate and they'll drive a car that they hate and they'll wear clothes that they hate, yeah. but they have saved a ton of money and they do not want to part with it, mm-hmm. right? So they're coming from a place of scarcity that they're squirreling it all away and, and heaven forbid they buy something that gives them pleasure. Then there's the other team where the pendulum swings way too far the other way and they're spending all their money and then next year's money and their friend's money and their credit cards, they're borrowing all the money they can to buy things that they really should not be buying yet. So yeah. find yourself somewhere in the middle. That's the safe zone to be. Don't yeah. be too cheap where it yeah. literally starts to make you feel not abundant and have a bad life. But then don't go you know, squandering all your money like I did when I was young for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. What is your mentality on the money that should be put into the business? When is it too soon? When mm. do you know you need to hire on more people? How do you assess how much you guys are going to put into hires? That's a big big part of your life now. You guys hire out a lot of things. Yeah, it's a huge part. So here's my general rule of thumb that we can kind of work backwards. Um, If it is not income producing at the rate that I value my hourly time at or higher, and if it is not joy producing, then I delegate it. Mm. And right, this is the time where everyone's like, well, must be nice because I can't do it. No, everybody can do it. You just haven't quite figured out how to redirect your money yet. And you you have not taken the time to figure out what your income producing time is worth. So here's how you do it. It's a really easy formula. Take how much money you want to make this year yeah. and be semi-realistic, right? So challenge yourself, but don't go too pie in the sky. And then divide that by the number of hours that you're willing to work in a year. And for most people, it's 2,000 hours. But the way you find the number of hours you want to work in a year is very simple. If you're going to work 50 weeks, yes, I know there's 52 weeks in a year, but people take vacations. Yeah. If you're going to work 50 weeks and you're willing to work 40 hours a week, that's how you get 2,000 hours. Yeah. But if you only want to work 20 hours a week, 
and you're going to work 50 weeks. Now you have to divide that value by a thousand hours. So find out two things. One, what you want to make. Two, how many hours you're willing to work in a year. Income producing hours. Divide the hours into the amount of money that you want to make. And that's your hourly value. So like right now, as we sit here today, my hourly value is $4,000 an hour and it goes up every year. Mm. So I won't do any tasks that are not income producing at the rate of $4,000 an hour or higher mm. or that aren't joy producing. Mm. So for example, uh, I used to love mowing the lawn. We don't have a lawn now. Now it's all hardscape, <laughs> right? But I used to love mowing the lawn. I would still, lawn? <laughs> I, do, I did. I would still mow the lawn today probably yeah. if we actually had a lawn. Uh, because it was joy producing, even though I could hire that out for cheaper. Yeah. But if you can hire it out for cheaper than your hourly value, you need to be hiring that out. And that's how you start to figure out what teammates you should hire and yeah. you know what 1099 employees you should hire, et cetera. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we share what is the most difficult thing for us right now in our business. Oh yeah, for sure. What's causing you to want to stick a pencil in your eyeball? <laughs> I mean, you mentioned it's just a lot of inundation or just it's just a lot. It's become I, a lot for you guys, right? I have Well, I have too many good ideas right now. Mm. And I have too many great human beings that also want to collaborate right now. Yeah. And an abundance of too many good things is still too many things, period, good or not. And so exercising my no muscle right now and not being overwhelmed, and that's a challenge for me. Yeah. Look, when I answered the door today, when you showed up, I was on a phone call, which was right after doing an interview with somebody else in the back. Like, it's a lot. And yeah. it's not necessarily a pace that's sustainable. So I struggle with that. What about you? Yeah, I would say the inundation and the noise of a lot of people wanting things from me now all of a sudden. And then um, scaling intimacy mm. is my biggest thing that I will continuously deal with. And I'm going to figure out how to master it. And I'm, I'm working on it right now. And that's how do I take this highly, highly engaged audience that I've trained to be almost my friend in a sense? How do I scale that? Because I can't answer all of them anymore. Yeah, And it's it's scaring me in full transparency. So I'm really committed to figuring out how I can do that because my greatest asset and my differentiating factor is that I've done that. And now what do I do when it's gotten to a point where I can't necessarily keep up with it or do it? Because I also want a life, you know, I want to get married and have kids. And I want to have a life. This isn't supposed to be what we do 24 seven, even though it is. So how do I do that? And for the listeners, when she says scaling intimacy, she is the absolute undisputed champion of not <laughs> pouring money into Facebook ads and all that stuff, but instead organically mm -hmm. creating relationships with people on social media to turn them into what I call raving fans and then serving them. You've yeah. done that better than anybody else. And that's why you've been able to make uh, such great profit margins up to this point. Mm -hmm. And so when she says scaling um, intimacy, that you can only do that for, you know, you can only answer so many messages. You can only mm -hmm. comment back so many, you can only do it to a point where you run out of time and energy and, and something's got to give. Yep. So I, I totally yep. get it. So what are you going to do about it? Just quit and, you know, join the circus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait, here's a question. <laughs> Go why, sell drugs. I why mean, do wait. you have to, wait, you already are. <laughs> why do you have to scale your intimacy, why do you mm. want more eyes, more customers? Mm. So my vision, it's its getting really, really clear. My vision actually is low touch, but high, high impact, high volume, low touch, which means my vision is the Tony Robbins effect, I'll call it, where it's millions and millions of people worldwide speaking, creating these experiences the vision is not for me to be a high level coach, only coaching so many people a year. So if you're listening to this and that's you, you're doing more of high touch, low, low, uh, low impact. I mean, it's still a high impact, obviously, but um, well, that's high touch, high impact, but low volume in a sense. And so knowing that that is my mission and I'm super aligned with that, I don't want to go super deep with a few people. I want to touch a bunch. Mm -hmm. And so once I found the clarity around that and they're very different business models, I've realized I will have to scale to a certain point where I'm hitting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And I'm doing it in a way where they still know that I do care. And I am wanting to build that relationship with them in a sense, but it's not healthy. Yeah. Okay. Let's use Tony. Influencer. You use Tony Robbins as an example when, yeah. you, when you said that. Do you think he's accomplished that? I think he hit a point in his career where he realized that in order to do the work he needs to do, he can't respond to, to every person and that's okay. And it doesn't mean it's still not impactful. Because some of the most impactful things in my life, I've never met that mentor. I've never met the author of the book. I've never met the speaker. I mean, 
I never will, but they've changed my life, life maybe more than someone who I've invested fifty, sixty thousand dollars in their mastermind. So it just proves that you can have this high impact on people, and I'm super committed to it without actually having to have that direct communication with them. Yeah. So I know that on a logical level, but the my ego is 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 hurt by that because I want to say and I want to be able to respond to everyone and know their story. And at my event, I mean, I stayed up till one a.m. with a line of five hundred people wanting to tell me yeah. their life story. I found that. I wanted to be there and do that and hear that, but that's not healthy and that's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. So, <laughs> so can I try and free you up a little bit? Of course, free me, Chris, free me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's my perspective on this. Ah! <laughs> yeah, get out of here. Here's my perspective on this. Um, a lot of times our fear is when I stop being so high touch with everybody, I'm gonna leave somebody behind. I'm not gonna serve them. And then they're gonna be left behind. And worst case mm-hmm. scenario, they may say, oh, Angie Lee, she doesn't care anymore. Mm-hmm, right, mm-hmm, that's our, mm-hmm. that's our that's, deepest fears. Yep. But here's the flip side of the coin. If you don't continue to transcend, if you don't continue to work with more people, maybe in a less touch type of way, then you're not moving up and creating room for the new up and coming coaches that are craving the low volume, high touch. Mm -hmm. So every time that you move up and become less available, those people, they'll still tap into you and learn from you, but they're then going to go seek somebody who's high touch, if that's what they need in the moment. And that becomes the customer for the new up and coming coach. So you're making room as the universe is supposed to work. You're making room for these new up and coming talented individuals Mm -hmm. to do the high touch thing while you go do the high volume thing. Yeah. I like that. I love that. I love that feedback. That's good. What is driving you right now? What is, what are you most excited about? The thing that you're like, if I could just do this, I would do this. I don't care about the money. What's the thing that you guys are doing together or you individually that you do genuinely wake up and think that this is fun? You know, here's the thing. It is about the money right now. And here's why. I'm trying to create legacy money to take care of our families forever. I feel the pressure to do that. Ooh, and so, what does that mean? Are you open to, to yeah, sharing with for sure. Are you guys looking to- For sure. So, you know, we make a, a great living right now. And when I say our family, this is this will help add to the numbers so you understand why we're driving so hard. Uh, we make a great living right now where Lori and I wouldn't have to work or work hard mm-hmm. if we were just worried about Lori and I and the one or two kids we're going to have. And waffles. We'd be set. We'd be fine. And waffles. <laughs> and uh, who's going to live forever? Thanks to your CBD. <laughs> Thanks to your pet CD, CBD. We now pause this episode for yeah. Soul CBD ad. Wait, where can they get it? <laughs> Swipe up soulcbd.com. If your dog uh, is crazy, you need this. <laughs> she does love your CBD. Okay, so- um, Back to the episode. <laughs> when I say take care of our family and, and create legacy money, here's what I mean. Yeah. My brother has bet on us. He is our COO. Mm-hmm. And so because he's bet on us, his livelihood depends on us having a- successful enough company forever so that he'll forever have that career. Now, would he be fine on his own if all of a sudden we went belly up? Yeah, he's a smart, resourceful guy, but he's bet on us. And so I feel the responsibility to making sure that's always there, but it gets way more than that. My parents have bet on us as part of their retirement so that they can have a better retirement and come out here and live out here six months at a time. We help with that, right? But her parents, Lori's parents, we support their entire life, their cars, their homes, their everything. They would literally be on the streets without our financial assistance or they'd be living with you know, her brother or something like that where they don't have room. Yeah. Her brother, who we love, like coolest young kid on the planet. He has three kids. Uh, he's married to three kids in Midwest. And he's one of the hardest working, works two jobs to make ends meet. One of the hardest working guys I know. And he's doing all the right things. But- he also lives in an area where unless he catches a break, quite honestly, they're they're probably not going to get on this big winning streak. Mm-hmm. You never know. Anything can happen. Mm-hmm. So I feel responsibility to create legacy wealth so that they're protected. And so it goes on and on and on to these different layers of family that I feel responsible to take care of and honored to yeah. take care of. So this is not a burden. Mm-hmm. This is this comes from the, your question where you said, well, what drives us when we get up and, and when's enough enough? When we are so financially secure that none of our families will be at risk for wanting anything to have a decent life. Mm, I love that. And so do you feel this this calling to now do this for your future kids or? Oh yeah, for sure. Like I want, I want to make sure that our kids get to choose how they want to create impact in the world. Yeah. Not that they have to take a job or take a career because uh, you know they need to, to make the money and support the family. I want my kids in a perfect scenario I want my kids to not only be able to be around grandma and grandpa as much as they want. So, you know, that takes money to bring them out here. But um, so that when they go through life, 
you know, obviously, hopefully we'll be inspiring parents. We'll help them figure out what they want to do. When they go through life, I want them to be able to say, you know what? I want to start a charity. Like I want to skip having a career. I want to start a charity Mm -hmm. or I want to travel the world or I want to write books or who knows what they're going to want to do, but I want to give them that choice. Yeah. What are your thoughts on having it all? Describe it all. The, the business, the career, the money, but then you also have the family life, the kids, you know, yeah. what are your thoughts on that as a woman who is similar, obviously to your wife and the fact that I'm extremely ambitious, I'm on this rocket ship. You discuss this even at Pays Be Brave, yeah. this, this concept of this rocket ship and people after were just raving about this rocket ship analogy. And now I use it with dating and, and now while looking for that guy who wants to not only be on the rocket ship, but also bring some gasoline, you know what I'm saying? Richard <laughs> so, Branson, Elon Musk. <laughs> hey, Richard, if you're listening to this, I'm single. If you want to come over to Chris's and hang out. <laughs> but it's an interesting concept, right? Because we see a few women doing it and I'm super committed to doing it. You know, I was just with Shaleen and I know Lori was as well. And I said that to her. I said, you are such a beautiful example for me as a young woman of how how you've done it all. And it's there hasn't been a lot of women to look up to in that sense. So it's I'm curious your guys' thoughts yeah. on having it all, quote unquote, okay. right? I totally get where you're going. Here's my opinion. Because <laughs> it's a controversial, but it's also like, yeah. how do we do it? I totally, okay, here's my opinion. And and I speak from watching Lori and watching other families yeah. and the people that we coach with and all that stuff. Chris is about to tell me I'm going to be single for the rest of my life. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I believe that you can have all categories and have success in all categories that you want, right? So yeah. family, kids, career, money, impact, you can have success in all the categories. Matter of fact, it should be your goal to live a well-rounded life where you do have success in all categories, but there's always going to be one category that's thriving and one category that's lagging. And that's okay. Mm. Like it's okay that one category is lagging while you go work hard on one that means a lot to you right now. So um, let me give you an example. I would love right now to be five pounds less. And I know we live in a time right now where like, oh, like pro body, this pro body that you shouldn't care about your five pounds. Well, I give a shit about my five pounds. Okay. I really do. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but so that part of me is lagging a little mm-hmm. bit, but it's still successful because I'm still fit. I'm yeah. still healthy. Um, I may not be like, hey, let's go to the beach and take pictures of me worthy right now, but <laughs> I'm at least physically healthy and capable and like how I look in clothes. Yeah. And this may sound like a really shallow example to people, but it's one category that means a lot to me yeah. that, you know, on some measures is successful, but is lagging compared to our finances and our businesses. And the other things where I'm pouring fuel on that fire at the expense of this one. Yeah, I love that. That makes sense. It's it's knowing you can have it all, but maybe not all at once. Yeah, everything makes, goes seasons. in seasons. Seasons for sure. Seasons, seasons. So when you, when you are talking about finding the husband and yeah. having the family and all that, Absolutely, you can have all of those things on a successful level, but you get faster what you prioritize. So while you're over here building your massive CBD company and everything else, you're prioritizing that. I have no idea. I haven't asked you, but I'm guessing that maybe dating is a close second, right? Yeah, yeah. And now it's... I'm trying to put it more into one so Ah, that I can go into that season. There we go. See, until you make it number one, it may be successful, but it's not going to be the thriving category. Yep. Yeah, it's a very interesting time, right? Because I could put my head down and just not focus on it, but I do, it is something that's very important to me. And so knowing what's important to us and what season we're in. This makes me, oh my God, I totally want to ask you something. It's all seasons. Okay, hold on. This is about being a single woman okay. and dating when you're really Ooh, financially this successful. This just got juicy. Ready? <laughs> yeah. So as a successful, financially successful woman, mm-hmm. super like type A, you know where you're going, you're not going to apologize for it and no one's going to change that course for you. Is it tough to meet men that support that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And my audience wants more episodes on this because it's been extremely interesting with uh, men. And, you know, the biggest thing I have found is I'm this weird dichotomy where I'm extremely driven and passionate and want to make all this money and do great things. And I'm like, what are we the next Tony Robbins? Right? Like that's super clear. Like whoever that is has to know that's me. But then in my relationship, I'm extremely feminine. I'm just like, Oh, do everything for me. Come save me. Right? Like mm-hmm. I can't even open this pickle jar. Like who am I? <laughs> and so I think that's been great to have that nice balance. But what I have found that there are men who are looking for an ambitious woman, but then they're a little bit more so in, I'm not attracted to him. I'm not, I'm not looking for that mm-hmm. more of just the supporter role, or it's been where it's 
they are attracted to all the other aspects, but they don't want to be with someone who's so driven because he feels as if he could not keep up with that and it would never be enough. And so that's what I experienced with a lot of these men I've dated. I've dated these big CEOs even, and they don't actually want to be with another boss babe. They want to be with a woman who, in so many terms, let's just keep this episode real, stay home all day and bake cookies. And if that's what you're doing, totally fine. Listen, do what you, you know, it's your life, but that's not me. And it never is going to be Angie. I will always be the person who I'll be that mom. I'll be home during the week, but then I might be flying somewhere to go speak or it's going to be crazy. It's going to be absolutely all over the place. Right. And so it's now about, which I'm, I'm dating this new man who is an amazing guy, but I think that he is now the first example of someone who wants both and is seeing that it's possible and is, and is recognizing that it's okay. And it's safe to be with someone who's super powerful. Mm, okay. So it's so, interesting, right? Yes. Yeah, super. And it mm-hmm. leads me to the next question. Super controversial, yeah. but I get DM this question more than you would ever think. And it's Uh-oh. weird. Like, why are you DMing me this? So I will get <laughs> the question in one form or another. Chris, could you please do an episode on why women are more attracted to guys with money? Yep. You know, the old That's adage, it. like she's just chasing money or she just yep. likes him because he's rich and all that stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. I love this question. Expand, I actually love this question. Expand on that whole yeah. urban legend, you know, where, mm-hmm. I don't know, what does it bring up in you? Yeah, yeah. And in, in full transparency, I got out of a relationship where I was the financial supporter for the last year and a half. And it built up so much resentment in my system that I ended up hating him and, and the situation. And it, it ended, there was other reasons as well. And he's a great person, but that was the situation we were in. So my system was then craving the complete opposite, almost like the pendulum swing. So then my mission was to go find the richest guy I could find because that would fix all my problems. Well, mm-hmm. fast forward, that didn't work either because I still obviously have to respect and love that person. And money doesn't mean he's a great guy. And so it's kind of recalibrating now to this clarity I've had recently around this question of the answer is I'm looking for a guy who is extremely financially abundant, I should say, because that is a byproduct of him probably being a really ambitious guy. Yes. And I have to be with the most hungry, ambitious guy. I mean, he cannot be married to me and not be like hella ambitious. Yep. And so as a byproduct, my husband will be someone who makes a lot and does very well. There's no specific number on that. He doesn't need to be, it doesn't even need to be anything that insane, like billions of dollars or even multi, multi, multi millions. No, it just needs to be a guy who's doing extremely well. He's abundant. And as a byproduct, I find it extremely attractive that he can sustain his, his, himself. And I think that's going back to this primal, you know, it's, it's a very primal thing. This is thousands of years of it DNA. Is. I want someone to support me, yep. right? But that's a little weird and confusing because you're like, well, Angie, you could be the supporter. You make enough to, to handle both. That doesn't mean I want no, to be. And you mean I energetically support be. you. Yeah, energetically and financially and yep. all of that. Yep. But I could. So a guy is probably confused a little bit. Like, why don't you just be the breadwinner? I don't want to be the breadwinner. Yeah. But I can be, which is very ironic because a lot of girls sometimes want to be then. They're okay with it this in is this situation. Fascinating. So my answer is always been So I'm traditional, right? I'm traditional in my role of like Midwest. The guy is the leader and the supporter. But then I'm Midwest like this thing. boss babe who like makes all this money. So it's like, what the, what? how do I get, how do I get both? <laughs> it's funny. You know, I've always answered it this way when people <sighs> ask me. Um, I've said, I think that women, not like I'm some expert, right? I just lucked out and got one really great wife. But <laughs> lucked out. <laughs> I think that women are attracted to the traits mm-hmm. that create the byproduct, just yeah. like you said, yeah. which happens to be money, right? Mm-hmm. So to the ambition, to the growth, to the hustle, um, to the the dynamic personality, to whatever mm-hmm. traits it takes mm-hmm. to create the byproduct called money, they're not out there. I mean, of course, there's someone sit with a, a goal and a number, but yeah. for the most part, they're not out there saying, I need to find a rich guy. They're saying, I need to find a person with all these traits and all these traits just happen to produce a ton of money. Yep. I always say the hottest, most, the, the sexiest thing is resourcefulness. Mm-hmm. That And that's such a girl thing to say, right? Like, oh, resourcefulness. But it's just the hottest thing in the world is a guy being like, I got you. We're okay. If it if the boat goes down, I've got it. I got a thing. Like we can, mm-hmm. we, we can figure this out. And so as a woman, my body is craving resourcefulness because I don't want to be the one who's bringing all the resources because that scares me. If the boat goes down, oh my God, shit, I have all the resources. You don't have any, you didn't bring any to the table. Yeah. It doesn't energetically feel fair. And so what we're really attracted to is resource, resources. You know what's interesting? So, you know, Lori and I have been married. It'll be 14 years this August coming up. Wow. And when I was with the bank and, and when my career was thriving and, and when we were living beyond our means, Lori never had a chance to have any type of career yet at that point mm-hmm. in her life, okay? I would move her every year. I'd say, go pick out a house. I'm getting on an airplane. Mm-hmm. And I was the only breadwinner. And when we lost everything, I remember her literally saying to me, you know, this is my time to figure out what I want to do because I'm never going to let this happen again. Mm-hmm. Now, this was the best thing that ever happened for our relationship because she found the Lori that everybody knows today. Yeah. And it became both of us 
having seasons where we kind of exchange back and forth. So I pulled back and we helped grow her Mm -hmm. and then she pulled back for rest and helps grow me. And then I pull back and we help grow her. And we literally do this really cool dance of uh, um, applying our resources, our team, our money, our, our energy, our everything to whoever wants to be in the forefront right now. And that doesn't, it's not a zero sum game. So it's not like if Lori's in the forefront, I'm in the back doing nothing. What it means is someone's always in a relationship like this when you're two driven people with lots of things that you want to do. Yeah. Everyone's always going to be maybe two steps further in the forefront than you. And you have mm-hmm. to be okay with that, knowing that your season when they need to rest is going to come around and you get to be two steps. And it's just uh-huh. this really cool dance back and forth. That's good to hear. That's good advice for me because that keeps, that's healthy for me to know. And realize it's never always going to be a zero sum game. Yeah. That's not realistic. I can't expect that man to always be at my level or to want to be. And then when I want to be pregnant and maybe Angie Lee actually does want to just chill out for a little bit. I mean, I'll probably still do a lot of fun stuff, but what if I do just for nine months or a year, he's got to pull the weight then. And then maybe he'd go back to me for a while. Yep. That's Lori's year right now. She's, she literally said to me, she said, Chris, this year, I just want to create space. I don't want to do any of the things I'm doing anymore. Which is normal. She's probably tired. Yeah. We get, we go through seasons. That was it. Can't go a hundred miles per hour forever. And it felt, I, I was so good with it. Like, I was like, awesome. Like, I'm glad that we can create that space for you. Hey, I got this full speed ahead. Mm. And so it's really cool that, and if you let it happen, it happens naturally. By the time I'm tired, she'll be ready to go again. Yeah. And then by the time she's tired, I'm like raring to go again. I love that. Isn't and sometimes it? they overlap, but you have to communicate your way through that. So yeah. here's some real insight. When Lori had her big book launch last year, yeah. it took up all of our resources. Our, all of our marketing dollars, all of our marketing time, our team, our t- literally our physical time, our energy, it took everything. And it was exhausting. I was raring to go. I had so many big projects and, and I was like, hey, it's my turn, I'm ready. But because she was using all the resources, I had to learn to be okay with waiting just a little bit longer yeah. till she was done on that sprint. And we had some um, conversations where there was stress, like, I told her once, I'm like, babe, I'm sorry. I'm just being honest. I'm resentful right now that I want to do X, Y, and Z, yeah. but you're using all of our resources on your book. And I said, by the way, wow. I know I fully acknowledged that now is the time for your book and that I'm excited about it. Wow. But it's also being honest about my resentfulness that was starting to show up because I couldn't use those resources. Wow. So That's it's some of the not, realest shit I think you've yeah, ever shared so it's, on your show. It's never going to be this wow. clean break where it's perfect timing that one's in front and the other one is tired and wants to leg back. There'll always be overlap, but you've got to communicate your way through that overlap, knowing that your time is coming. Wow. Your turn. Wow. Wow. That's super real. I love that. I love that. That means that it's not always, it's not always balanced. No, no. It can't be. Balance is the biggest lie on the planet. <laughs> this goes back to your original question. Can yeah. you have it all? Yeah. You can have all categories in a successful way, but one's going to be out ahead of the other one. Balance is bullshit. That's yeah. what we should title this episode. <laughs> oh my God. That'd be awesome. Wow. This was juicy. I was like, man, we were going to jam on marketing a little bit. Maybe we should close it out with some business, some marketing. All right. Let's do but it. But you guys just got to hear some good stuff. I mean, you guys got to hear a little bit about my love life, <laughs> Chris's <laughs> love life. <laughs> you know, it's, but this all is marketing. This all does apply to business because it does. Most people listening have the goal of having a partner yeah. and they're going to have to know if they're, a, first of all, they're not listening to our shows if they're not motivated and like have big dreams, mm-hmm. right? So the very fact that you're listening to this show right now means that you are motivated, you have big dreams, you're trying to accomplish something and most human beings at some point are going to want a partner and you need to know how to navigate that. And actually, what a great example because you're sitting here single, I'm sitting here married. Mm-hmm. So we cover both sides of the gamut yep. to talk about what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, my DM is is full of women asking me, I'm with a boyfriend or a husband who's not supportive. What do I do? What happened? Why did you, you know? And I think that they're very intrigued with what type of man would I end up with? How does that work for these ambitious women? And you'll notice there, there's always a different type of guy they're with. Sometimes they're with just a supporter role who's in the back, sometimes another leader. It, it, it kind of differentiates. So I'm in that I'm in that period of asking myself that question of what does Angie need mm-hmm. to be happy? Not just what does my ego want or what do I think I need or what does she have? So I need to have that type of husband. What do I need to genuinely be happy? And who do I want to be that teammate? Because it's, it's a team. Who do I want to be on the rocket ship? You know, because it's going to be a long journey and he's got to be ready to buckle up because it's about to get crazy. I mean, I anticipate the next 10, 20 years of my life being crazy before it really calms down. I mean, again, we'll have the seasons of calming down, but I have a little, I fear, obviously you guys can hear it in my voice of, of who is that going to be? Does that even exist? Like, who is that? 
It's funny. Who is that epic human? Because they're like, who's like, all right, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> and I can handle all of this. <laughs> you know what's funny? The next 10, 20, of your, 20, next 10, 20 <sighs> years of your life are going to be crazy because they are. you're only going to be 49 in 20 years. Only? No, oh. Only because <laughs> I say here is 41 right now and it's gone so quickly yeah. that- Trust me, by the time that you're 49, you're still going to feel like young and vibrant. How old do you feel? You look so great and young and vibrant. I feel, okay. So (laughs) mentally, (laughs) like maturity wise, I feel 16. Um, (laughs) And Lori would back that up. Uh, Physically, I feel about 30. Okay. Isn't that interesting? Okay. I I feel like when I picture myself without looking in a mirror, I see, I know it sounds weird, a 30 year old person because I feel like a 30 year old person. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you feel like you're just getting started though, career oh, yeah. wise, mentally? Barely. You're still just as hungry. Tip of the iceberg. Okay. So your hunger has not diminished now. Hungrier than ever right wow. now. Wow. So do you yes. think my hunger is going to go down? No. 40s and 50s? No, okay. not at all. I think I think you'll have seasons like we just talked about. Yeah. Like I'm burnt out. I don't care about any of this right now. But so far, it's done nothing but get exponentially bigger. Oh, but you know why? Okay. Here's what we can talk about next. Yeah. I think my hunger is. Oh, no, I don't think. I know my hunger is so high right now because the people I've been hanging around have kept changing higher and higher and higher in terms of their accomplishments. Mm. So my new norm becomes whatever my tribe's norm is. Yeah. And my tribe's norm is now the ones that are selling companies and taking their, their 100 million and then putting it. And I'm sitting here like, wait a minute. Now I need to build and sell a company and that's my new goal. Uh, and yeah. so the hunger comes from me always increasing my tribe that has the influence on me. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. You constantly are just finding a new, a new carrot. There was a day you, I'm interested to get your take on this. There was a day where I thought if I make a million bucks, game over, all's done. <laughs> now I think a million dollars is nothing. <laughs> Seriously. Like if, if yeah. I don't make a million dollars by February, I'm pissed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, isn't that funny? Well, it just changes so quick. Well, it's the lifestyle too. California is no joke. California is no joke. Mm-mm. You got to, you, California made me hungry. I mean, you see how people are living and how I do want to live, which is part of my vision. I call it the vision for my life is to have that beautiful beach home and to provide my children with a lot of great things. I mean, it's not, it's not, a, it's not living in Illinois anymore. No, it's so- but That's a choice. So. Okay, let's talk about this. And this is environment, this is tribe. So we're just gonna use California as the example, but I expect yeah. everybody listening to know this is an example. What we're really talking about is your surroundings having an impact on you, okay? Mm. So when I moved out here, my dreams got exponentially bigger. Yep. And all of a sudden I saw how people make them happen and it became real for me. That's an example of your environment radically changing your self expectations of yourself. Lori and I often talk, if we moved away from here, sure, we'd save way more on taxes and on cost of living. But I do believe that our ambition would go down because we're not surrounded daily and having lunch daily and dinner mm-hmm. daily with all of the biggest doers in the world. 100%. And so it would end up being a net net type of equation. Yep. You're you know? literally paying 40% more, but you're literally going to be inspired to make yeah. 40 to 50% more. So when when did so. your environment like really make you take off when you got out here? When I moved out to California exactly two years ago. And I knew that's why I moved here. I mean, I remember talking to you guys during it. I just knew that it would be the smartest thing I could do for the show and for my my brand and just being in the environment of people who are extremely ambitious. And it was the best, one of the best decisions I've ever made for my life, hands down in my career. Yeah. Let me start by saying this. There's wealthy, successful people in every city and every state. Okay. Of course. So yeah. duh, there's the baseline. I don't need hate mail, but here's my next question. <laughs> here's my next question. Do you think you could have reached or would have reached this level of success had you stayed in Chicago, which by the way is a kick-ass city? It is. It is. Yes, but slower. Ah, good answer. I'm always curious to know, like, would you have gotten there and you know, what's the, the timeline difference? I just wanted to be on a rocket ship, not a not a little bird scooter outside. <laughs> <laughs> not on a little boat going down Chicago Even River. those are fun, but I just wanted it to be faster. You know, my goal is to be at a certain point. So then in my mid thirties, I'm a little bit more in that season of, okay, family, kids. Like it's just, I almost intentionally, I've been very intentional with all this. There's a, there's a vision with it, right? Of how the, the pace that I'm going. And so, um, yeah, I did it to speed up the process. Okay, so obviously we're sitting here from the perspective of having a lot of successes. Yeah. But I want to talk to the people that are listening right now mm. that feel like they have just effed up or like mm. they are not going anywhere. And here's how I want to address it. Tell me about one of the businesses you started that was an absolute turd. Keyword, turd. turd. <laughs> 
So my brother and I, we have a successful company now. Obviously, we have a, a CBD line, Soul CBD, and we're we're building that to a hundred million dollar company. We just signed with an investor. Super exciting. So that's sexy, right? That sounds great. But about five six years ago, my brother and I started a food distribution line. That was one of my goals: is to start a food delivery business in Chicago. Um, I thought it was it was the wave. That was before it was super super trendy. And um, we put a lot of money, heart, soul, energy. We put a lot of resources into that. And it ended up obviously not doing well in the, you know, the food industry is a crazy industry to get into. Um, and so I remember that being a big hit on us. We, we learned a lot of lessons about scaling and growing and investing, but that was one of the businesses where we, again, we were aligned, we were passionate, there was a need for it and it just didn't pan out the way we wanted to. And we lost a lot of money and now it's, it's kind of bittersweet to sit around and have those moments of, and that's why I, I called him crying when he got the investor because because of that moment, I remember sitting with him in a kitchen, in the, in the kitchen, just being super stressed about our finances with that company and now getting another phone call saying, here's a few million dollars. And so I love those full circle moments in life because it just proves that it's always going to come back around and a better thing's coming, right? That's so cool. It's a cool moment. That is really cool. And doing it with someone you love. I mean, there's nothing better than running a business with someone you love. You obviously do How do you make that work day. working with family? Because it's really working out for you and I. Yeah. Do you recommend it for people? I usually don't, but because he is the numbers guy, he's the analytics, he's the left brain, he's able to be in that position. And then I am right brain, creative, big picture, visionary. So we come together, we balance each other out really well. And because he's my brother, you know, I, I see him a lot, but I'm not married to him. I imagine marriage is actually harder because I yeah. don't have to date my brother and, <laughs> yeah. you know, and so it's a, I don't have to keep that like sexy relationship with my brother. We're able Unless to- Unless you live in West Virginia. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't need hate mail. <laughs> Just making Let's a West Virginia joke. You Tom, things are getting a little <laughs> weird. You know what I'm saying? But so I do believe that you got, you're actually doing something more difficult than me. But um, when you love someone, there's nothing cooler than creating something together. I feel like we do have this kid together that we just both love and to text each other every day about the exciting moments. I'm like, man, before I die, I'm just going to know that this was one of the coolest things to do with someone and to make money together, cr- to create energy together is is priceless. That's awesome. So I can imagine it's a cool feeling for you guys. So it, it truly is. So I want to share one of my failed businesses just yeah. to inspire everyone who feels like they're hitting a wall right now. When I was in my early 20s, you know, I had the entrepreneurial bug yeah. and I had left college or got kicked out of college and um, I started a cleaning company. God, most people don't know this. Yeah. So I was going out to the bars a lot back then. Mm-hmm. And I knew everyone that owned all the bars and clubs. So it was very easy to say, hey, what are you? Well, matter of fact, one day I was talking to one of them and they told me what they pay their cleaners to come in the middle of the night. I was like, what? At the time, <laughs> it was a lot of money to me, a ton of money to me. Yeah. It seemed absurd. And so I'm like, wait, I'll do that. I'll start a cleaning company. Give me your contract. Yeah. And so I went around, I got the contracts to start cleaning all of the bars and clubs and restaurants and like this random golf course and stuff all around the Green Bay area where I was living. And it turned into... At the time, it felt like a lot of money. I was 21 and just booted out of college. It turned into like six or $7,000 a, a month, right? Mm. And it happened like overnight. And it felt like, oh my God, I have a successful business. But then finding, first of all, I couldn't go around cleaning all the places myself. And it had to be done in the middle of the night after bar closes. Yeah. And um, finding talent that wants to come and clean bar toilets in the middle of the night while everyone's sleeping and thinking, thinking that you're going to find a lot of reliable human beings yeah. was a nightmare, a nightmare. So pe- people just straight up no shows, stealing, breaking things, like you name it. It was the craziest education in actually running a business and having humans that you have to hire and rely on. And it was a shit show. And I remember I ended up just... Uh, you know, failing at the whole thing, giving up all the contracts that I was so excited to get at first. And I kept like two places that paid three grand. A, wait, oh, no, I'm sorry, it was seven grand a week that I was excited about. And then, so I kept two places that uh, paid like three grand a week. And that was it. And then I just kind of did those two places. I remember I did it with my mom for a while. God, people it. don't know this. That's crazy. So for like a year in the middle of the night, I'd go clean bars and offices in the middle of the night with my mom. Isn't that crazy? Wow. You're sharing yeah. a story you've never shared. Yeah. I just, I always forget to talk about these things because they're so long ago. Because so long ago now you don't feel it anymore, but it's fun to sit and feel and feel it and think about it. Yep. Because now, I mean, look at your, look where you are. But boy, did I learn from that business what it was going to take to find and hire and, and manage people. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Oh, I love that. 
I love that. That's Nuts. good. Yeah, that's crazy. So um, what, Oof. if you could teach one thing to everybody listening right now, that's going to change their business, what would it be? Oh, Ooh, that's a good question. Only one thing. Only one thing. <laughs> Only one thing. Their online business, right? Let's say it's an online business sure. or what kind of business any are they business, in? Any business, doesn't matter. Any entrepreneur listening. Mm. I believe all principles, if, if you choose to really dig into them, can apply to any business. My answer is actually going to be something that is is relevant for me right now and I think is is the answer and it's you know a tactical part of me wants to say video marketing that's how you reach people video marketing changed my life it blew up my business 100% but my intuition wants to say mastering your mood and mastering your energy mm. I truly believe that none of this is possible whether it's creating content showing up powerfully engaging with your audience hosting events running a company nothing you're doing is possible without the fuel and the gas and the energy. And I'm realizing that now while I'm trying to manage a few different companies and do all these things that if I'm tired, it just doesn't work. And so your energy comes first and mastering your mood comes first, which means successful people master their mood. And I talked about this on an episode with, uh, with my feedback from Tony Robbins and he teaches this. And essentially it's knowing that successful people can take themselves from a really shitty, crappy mood and then bring it back up really fast. Our bounce back rate is extremely fast. Yeah. Whether you just lost money, whether you're like, I don't want to create content today, but let's do it. Let's pull, pull, you know, pick, pull the big girl pants up and let's get it done. That ability to, to vacillate with my emotions and my ability to get back up is what has made me successful. That's it. I'm not the smartest. I don't have the most resources. I'm just extremely ambitious and I'm able to change my mood really fast. That's really powerful. See, shit every time people answer questions like this, it's not like, oh, build this funnel or do this. It's always something very interpersonal. Absolutely. It really is. I just know a girl will be successful when I can tell that she's able to manage her energy. Because you know, I mean, when you're exhausted, you're not able to make good decisions. Mm-hmm. You're not a good leader, business owner, husband. You don't create that day. You don't, I mean, nothing gets done. And so if the game is content creation and the game is putting out energy, you better figure out how to make this vessel feel good all day yeah. and learn how to bounce back quickly. Yep. Because if not, you're screwed. It's so true. <laughs> Full confession, I'm slightly hungover right now because I went out to a business dinner last night that went way longer than I expected. And I drank wine the whole time and uh, thought I was just going to like have a glass of wine and this thing went like three hours longer than expected. And so it stuck up on me and I woke up today and I felt like garbage, but I had to learn mm. how to overcome that, sweat it out, choose a different pers- attitude. Cause I mean, I was feeling like a two out of 10. Wow. Choose a different personality and make all of the interviews, all of the calls, all the, all the everything happen. I didn't get to call in sick. I didn't get to play wow. small. I didn't get to flake. I just wow. had to choose a mood and choose a a physical personality that would be able to make it happen. I love that. Exactly. You had to choose. Yeah. Because if this was only done when you really wanted to do this, I mean. Yeah. Like what, what if, if I would have called you and been like, hey, sorry, I'm not feeling good today. And same thing with the interview I did in the backyard where they interviewed me. And then what if I canceled my calls? What kind of business am I really going to have in the long run? Nothing. One one where you give 50% and then yeah. you make 50% as much. Yep. Yep. And then I flake on people and they, they flake back because I flaked on them first. I love you know? that. This episode has been so real with you. Chris Chris was a little drunk. Chris shared about his <laughs> love life. I mean, this is like, this is some good stuff. <laughs> well, this is real life. Every You know, people only see- They see the perfect Chris. Yeah, this They only the see what they want to see. <laughs> Humans are funny. They only see what they want to see. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's funny now being in, in, that word influencer, right? We're both influencers. We influence people to do things. It's funny thinking that we're on this pedestal of perfection, right? Oh, good. Though. Of I got to have this perfect life and everything. And I'm this perfect human when I'm just trying to figure it all out. It's fascinating. I feel obligated to share my real journey with people mm. because of that reason. Because people's yeah. natural assumption, they put people on a pedestal way more than they should. Yeah. Uh, that's natural human nature. We do it to football players. We do it to actors, we do it to rock stars. Yeah. We put them on this pedestal. Like they are fantastic humans doing everything right. Mm-hmm. And so I actually feel the responsibility to be as vulnerable and to be as open with the journey as possible so that people don't feel like, oh, I'm not built their way. Well, I I, I got this DM from a girl when I uh, ended my engagement and, and broke up with my ex almost about nine, 10 months ago. And she DM'd me and said, I'm so surprised a woman like you who has everything figured out in her life. How is that not figured out? Why do you not have all pieces figured out? And I was like, whew, that's a nice thing to wake up to. Thanks, Susan. (laughs) Was her name really Susan? I don't remember her name. I think it was Tina. Who knows? But just kidding. I don't know her name. But it just got me thinking like people think that we have it all figured out and people think that 
because you have one area of your life figured out that you must have all of them. And that's not necessarily true. And to know that you can be successful in business, but yet it's difficult for you to maybe figure out how to do things in, in relationships. And I, I wrote her back just saying, I, I appreciate this. I'm going to take this well, but you realize that because of me being so ambitious and focused on work, maybe that is why that area of my life is a little bit more difficult. And it's funny, right? Talk about learning how to <laughs> filter out People send the, feedback. the meanest DMs, don't they? I'm like, oh, I literally can't believe the stuff that, you know, you get, Lori gets, I get, it's nuts. Mm-hmm. So here's, here's my piece of, of business advice that would change the game for everybody. It's learn how to master relationship capital. Mm. And so relationship capital is the capital that you build up just like money capital. Uh, it's the capital that you build up by doing so, by adding so much value to so many people that eventually there's nothing that you will ever want that can't be provided to you immediately. So, and this takes time. This takes intention. You have to intentionally listen for what people need yeah. and then see how you can solve that problem for them. It takes patience. You got to play the long game to wait for those opportunities to develop. Um, it takes the heart and the resourcefulness to borrow a word from you to help solve other people's challenges. But the more that you can make that your mission when you wake up every day, then you build up this relationship capital. And when you have so much relationship capital, yeah. it's there for you before you have capital capital. Like let's say I wanted to start a business, I needed funding. I know I could get any dollar amount right away because yeah. my relationship capital. Yeah. Um, it's there when you need capital capital. It's there when you need mental support. It's there when you need new ideas. It's there when you say, hey, I want to start a such and such company, but you don't know where to begin. Yeah. The relationship capital is the most valuable capital a human will ever accumulate. Yep, especially an entrepreneur. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, it is because at the end of the day, you could always go get more money, but unless you have that relationship capital, it's not, it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. I love it. Okay. So to start to put a bow on this thing, I always ask everybody a signature question at the end. Do you have one? I don't have a signature question. Actually, I do now. I came up with one recently. So So who's going to ask first? (laughs) You go ahead. All right. So give me a reason why people should be unapologetic about their pursuit of wealth and success. I love this question. <laughs> I feel as if it's it's going back to, it doesn't need to be mutually exclusive. It doesn't need to be mutually exclusive. And I was telling Chris, I'm getting this tattoo next week. I'm so excited. It's mm-hmm. the and sign, it's the ampersand. And I'm so passionate about it because I think it's, you can live an and life, not an or life. And this applies to money and success, 100%. And that's part of the tattoo. It's business, it's it's relationships, it's money. And I think that, so many people believe that you have to either make a huge impact on this world. You're Gandhi, you're a leader, you're the next Tony Robbins. You love people, you love humans, or you get to have the nice cars and the nice home and the nice things. You can have both. Why can't you have them all? Yes. My love for people and of giving and sharing, and I love humans. That's why I do, I mean, I just love them. That's why I do what I do. I'm here to help so many people. And that's so ingrained in me, I could cry, but that doesn't take away. And that doesn't diminish when I go buy a new car or I buy myself something nice that makes me happy or I go to Whole Foods and invest in some great supplements for myself. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't diminish. And so knowing that I can be unapologetic about the fact that I can do and be both and have this and life is what that means to me. That's awesome. I get to have and do it all, right? God, I love that. All right, (laughs) super awesome answer. My question is, um, going back to the energy, I'm, I'm super fascinated with how entrepreneurs take care of themselves because if it wasn't for your vessel, you wouldn't do what you do. So I would love to know maybe two of your favorite health hacks right now ah. that help you with energy, sleep, productivity, yeah. brain hacks. What do you do to make, when, when Chris is on fire and he's not drunk or hungover, <laughs> what does Chris do? Okay, listen, this is really important to me. So uh, one of them is a mental health thing and this creates more happiness mm. and abundance. I wake up to a mantra. I, lo- I wake up and I say out loud, I'm always the first one to pop my eyes open and say, I'm happier, healthier, wealthier, more fit than I was yesterday. And then I roll over and I wake up Lori I shake her by the shoulders and I say, babe, I'm happier, healthier, wealthier, more fit than I was yesterday. And I make her say it back to me. And it's like this love hate thing because she's groggy and she's like, I'm not going to say it. And then she'll mumble. I'm like, say it like you mean it. And then she'll say it like she means it. And bad, like crazy you guys thing have been to wake doing up that for to years. for years. Yeah, you've been so then I roll years. right back over and I have a 60 second gratitude prayer. And it's different every day, but I just take inventory of what I'm grateful for in a moment. Like I'm glad waffles is laying across my legs. I'm, Grateful for my uh, warm bed. I'm grateful for this pretty house. I'm grateful for Southern California, my health, my parents, mm-hmm. all that stuff, right? When you roll out of bed, having taken control of the first 90 seconds of what's going to be in your head instead of letting anything just pop into your head, yeah, you literally cannot get up on the wrong side of the bed. Yeah. 
right? And so that has a trickle down effect on the rest of your day that totally stacks up in your favor. Yeah. So that's number one is make sure that mental game from the first 90 seconds, the first two minutes, whatever it is of your day is on lockdown because that's on lockdown. Um, The next thing is daily movement. I don't care if I feel good or don't feel good. Like I woke up today not feeling good. By the way, if you guys have never listened to me before, this is a rare thing. Like this is not a normal thing for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is an accidental hangover, okay? (laughs) But I woke up not feeling good, but my daily movement in the morning is non-negotiable. That mm-hmm. sounds so gross like I'm talking about poop, but I mean physical movement, like yeah. working out. Yeah. And um, so whether it was soul cycle, like it was today, whether it's going for a run, whether it's uh, going to my personal trainer three days a week, my daily physical movement in the morning is a non-freaking negotiable. And because I put myself first in the morning before I allow anyone else to get a piece of me, I am then the piece of the cup or the part of the cup that is flowing over for everybody else the rest of the day. Yep. I love that. Got to move the body. You got to create energy to get energy back in. Without a doubt. I love it. I love it. This has been so good. It's been this awesome. Is we juicy. should do this more. This is fun. I like this format. I bet you we're going to get a bunch of people that are like, more relationship episodes. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what? Oh my I God. Mean, we could start a whole podcast yeah. on married and single. So like, I'll give my married <laughs> perspective. You give your single perspective. But then once I get married, this isn't going to be a funny show anymore. Well, <laughs> we'll bring him on. <laughs> hopefully this podcast will last a few weeks before you get married. <laughs> or a few, yeah. Or we'll start inviting single people on. No, it's true. I mean, we're at a point now with with our brands where, yes, they want to know marketing and sales and money talk, but let's be honest, the real questions I'm getting in my DM are questions like this. Yeah. They just want it. They're super curious about just life and yep. who are you dating and what do you think about this and, and the well, mindset stuff. So. Because it does affect their business. So it does yeah. make sense. Yeah, 100%. Love it. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Know that we love and appreciate you. Oh, you're amazing. We'll chat soon, guys. Bye. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.